All right, here we go. And welcome everyone to Veterans Voice of America. Uh, glad that you found us today. I'm, I'm talking with uh, a guest today, Benjamin Krause, and, and I'm sure many of you know him. He's the uh, he's an attorney and advocate for veterans, and he's also a disabled veteran himself. So welcome, Ben. How are you today? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, doing well. Doing well, cool. you know, very excited about the um the weekend and father's day and <laughs> Yay. having like everybody else do chores around the house i think that's very exciting enjoy um, your one day yeah, <laughs> that's all you get. I get exactly i get the day <laughs> and, and i'm pumped about it so you know i think that's all that matters very cool well i i have a lot of questions i want to ask you today and okay. i think let's start off with the easy stuff which is i know that that uh, recently there has been a department of veterans affairs accountability and whistleblower protection act sure and i'm i'm hearing some things sort of back and forth so can you explain for those people who may be listening that don't know what that is explain mm -hmm. what it, that is and then tell us how it's going to help uh, get rid of or fire those people in the VA that, that should be fired. Sure. So the long and short of it is that the uh, act will supposedly in theory um, shorten the amount of time and the rights of, at least to some degree, those who are uh, terminated or put into the termination process uh, within the VA. Um, they tried this in, in 2014 and it was passed and it was signed into law by Obama. And then Obama decided afterwards that he wasn't going to enforce it. Uh, so then they came back to the drawing board again, a second time, uh, which is recently now. And not only did they uh, pass the, the accountability act, but I believe they also tied in, or at least tried to tie in some reforms uh, regarding uh, appellate rights for veterans too. So it was kind of, what they at least initially tried, and I haven't read the language exactly that, that passed, but uh, what they were trying to pass, at least before, uh, was to hodgepodge the Accountability Act with uh, a veteran uh, rights reduction, basically. And so mm -hmm. they wanted to tie the two together and use the rhetoric uh, in favor of accountability and holding you know bad VA executives accountable uh, with, which of course they won't be accountable, but... Uh, and tie that in with uh, veteran right right reduction, and uh, I think that's what they uh, basically accomplished and pushed through. So, is now do do you really think that this is going to make a big difference? I mean, are you are you just thinking that this is just all words again, and it's not really going to be followed? Well, I think there were um, first of all part of the problem with everything that was going on within the VA is that we didn't have a Department of Justice that was doing its job under President Obama. They weren't prosecuting a senior executives who were openly engaged in fraud, waste and abuse, you know, different types of things, and were in turn allowing these executives to retire once they got caught rather than holding them accountable. And what we ended up seeing basically was a Veterans Affairs that would not prosecute claims against these executives and against other people uh, to the fullest extent that they could have. And so Sharon Hellman is a good example where... She eventually was uh, convicted as a felon for failing to uh, for for failing to uh, disclose uh, donations or, or contributions she received from a lobbyist that included uh, tickets to Beyonce and included tickets for her and her family to uh, Disneyland and I believe she was also given a minivan. So she was given these gifts from a lobbyist, didn't disclose them, uh, became a felon as a result of some of this. Uh, or pled to be a felon, basically. So didn't, I don't think went to trial. But nonetheless, so she was in trouble. And uh, But the Department of Veterans Affairs failed to uh, build a case against her regarding the waitlist scandal and how that might have uh, affected uh, things. And so when it came time to prosecute this before the MSPB board, which is uh, basically the merit board, uh, that part of the case, the case involving, you know, fraud and, and waste and abuse and hurting veterans, et cetera, that part of the claim was conveniently not developed well by VA's attorneys. Only, you know, a couple of these components would have steered it away from evaluating the extent of the scam 
that they were operating at, at, at uh, Phoenix VA. So that was within the control of the Department of Veterans Affairs and its attorneys, and they could have done something. They chose not to. That particular case is still in, in appeal uh, right now, and that was in 2014. So three wow. years later, it's still you know going back and forth in the courts. It was just remanded back to the Merit Board for review. And uh, we'll just see what happens. You know, it's, it's highly unlikely she'll get her job back. But if she did, wow, that would uh, certainly say a lot. And so the, the new accountability uh, rules will supposedly truncate that. But uh, what some executives are saying inside the Beltway is that the Accountability Act will really just be a way for executives to fire employees who are likely to hold them accountable when they have enough evidence. So and the whistleblowers. So the whistleblowers before they become protected whistleblowers will likely be terminated. And it'll just allow uh, a more, more quickly basically pushing out the, uh, the stubborn, honest VA employees who uh, are more likely to hold um, their executives accountable. Those employees usually become disgruntled because they're trying to do the right thing for quite a while. And eventually when they know that they're being targeted by the executive, they will, they will do something. This law might allow them to be terminated more quickly and uh, before they become protected whistleblowers. So uh, that's what some of the concern is. Uh, in addition to that, of course, if it was passed in the manner that I suspect it was, and again, I haven't had a chance to review uh, the bill as it was passed, but I believe it included language on veteran rights reduction, uh, which is not what it was uh, called, but it was basically appeals reform is what it was dubbed as. But uh, basically that will um, be a confusing mess that VA will struggle to adjudicate because it'll create more complicated processes to file and to process appeals claims, not make it more simple and not just add more heads to the folks that are, you know, adjudicating these issues or better training on the lower end. So they have, you know, um, positions that are more tenable and, and not appealable. Instead, what they're going to do is create all these different channels and lanes and this or that. And, and really at the end of the day, what's going to happen is it's going to be a hodgepodge and VA won't be able to process it uh, the right way. They'll get confused and it'll create more of a mess um, uh, probably within the next six months. Wow. And I, I want to remind everybody that is in watching and listening to this that please feel free to comment. Uh, feel free to ask questions during the broadcast. It's perfectly okay. Don't think that you're interrupting us and that you have to be silent. So any questions that you may have, even if it's not exactly on the topic that we're talking about, please feel free to go ahead and ask. Um, you know, that's one thing too. I, I think the VA, because of the whistleblowers and it, we've, they've been such an, uh, an asset on uncovering everything that they've uncovered about the VA so far and brought out to the public view. I think that it's going to be imperative, you know, for veterans and for the public to continue to keep an eye on this, you know, to make sure that the whistleblowers aren't stopped before they become whistleblowers. That, that somebody doesn't uh, in the VA fear that somebody may turn against them, so to speak, and do something ahead of time so that something's put in place to get them fired before they can become a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. So right. hopefully you'll keep an eye on that. <laughs> I'm sure well, that you I'm, will. I'm sure I'll hear about it, you know, sooner than later. I, I guarantee that. Now, will this bill apply to anybody retroactively? I mean, so for example, Hellman that you were talking about, is this going to apply to her or is it for anybody coming down, you know, any new people that need to be fired? Will it be well, applied? since it's a reduction in rights, I suspect that it'll be uh, prospective in nature and not retrospective. Okay. Okay. Which would make sense. So, wow. Unbelievable. Uh, well, I, I hope it does some good, you know, more so than what we've seen because, I mean, mm -hmm. do we know now about how many people have been fired? Uh, you, you know, under McDonald, it was easy. Less 10? Than 10. Less than 10. Uh, related to the waitlist scandal anyway. Supposedly that number is about less than 10. Yeah. And, and again, the laws weren't any different. Fraud is fraud. Uh, stealing is stealing. Uh, people dying because of your reckless behavior is still potentially a homicide. Uh, you know, these things are just their laws. They've been laws for hundreds of years. Like uh, we don't need new stuff. We need to enforce the laws that are on the books. And yet we continue to make new stuff as though somehow uh, what we have is not sufficient. But really, I think what it is, is a game of the government 
acting more like a python trying to squeeze out any good that's left in the system by creating these exacerbated situations where the public and the, the unsuspecting uh, public are, are maybe more, uh, more inclined to believe that this is what's required when really the issue is, you know, Mc, McDonald and his staff didn't prosecute the claims the right way. And President Obama's Department of Justice did not prosecute felons who were committing, you know, felonious activity. Uh, they didn't prosecute it. You know, they went after a few little guys and maybe, I mean, you just look at his, his actions right after uh, 2008. And again, I'd like to point out, I voted for him in 2008 because I believed that change meant more than, you know, loose change in my pocket. I thought he meant that he was going to do something about the Wall Street corruption and everything else that was going on. And I believe what they prosecuted one guy and then everyone else um, basically uh, laughed at our system went in front of Congress and asked for more money. Like, the, it's absurd. No accountability on Obama whatsoever, none. And now we have these out-of-control agencies, not just the VA, but also, uh, you know, the FBI, apparently, with the NSA, numerous other entities that are that are still out of control and, and running roughshod over our, our due process rights as civilians. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what happens when you have eight years to be in the dark and do all this stuff. I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I do agree with you. I think this, this, uh, um, accountability act, I, I really think it was something that perhaps the, the government, the current government is thinking needed to be done in order to sort of, uh, assure the public, the American public who doesn't know the inner workings of the D, of the VA that, mm-hmm. uh, w- look, we are taking action and here's what we're going to do. So I don't know how else they could have done that. Not that they needed well, to do that. I have an idea. They needed a couple perp walks out of a couple of VA medical centers with the director in handcuffs yeah. and photos of that. That's what they yeah. needed. Uh, yeah, no, and that's what normal police do. And that's what they could have done. In fact, that might've been cheaper uh, yeah. than doing all the crap that they did here with this accountability act. I mean, just arrest the people, you know, prosecute the people that do illegal stuff, you know, folks involved in scams and scandals and jiggering the system. I mean, this was obvious fraud. It was done with the intent of increasing the numbers so that the numbers would allow the executives to get bigger bonuses. Common sense. We know that they were doing it, you know, but they didn't get into it. They wouldn't investigate fully. And then when it came time to investigate fully, um, Sloan Gibson shut down the office of medical inspector and then allowed each local office to do their own investigation right after former, uh, OGC had Willie Gunn sent out notice basically, um, or at least implicit in the notice was to destroy all the files relevant to the investigation and gave everyone a week before uh, they were put on litigation hold by Congress. And again, but at the end of the day, Congress hasn't done anything. This has been a problem for 80 years. Uh, No president, unfortunately will probably resolve this. Um, Trump might be able to, because he's the only person that I can think of in the recent uh, past, who's definitely not a politician, and obviously he doesn't care what people think. I mean, look at the things he tweets, for Pete's sake. Uh, so maybe maybe he'll get it done. I don't know. But uh, any other normal politician, I guarantee nothing will happen. Status quo will prevail. You know, maybe Trump will get it done. Maybe he won't. I hope he does. But um, uh, but I don't see you know outside of this potential opportunity for somebody who doesn't care about what other people think everyone else I believe will have a problem. So uh, we'll just see. Now we have a question. It says, well, veterans lawyers have the same access to records as VSOs under the new merger. So I'm assuming that means merger. I'm assuming we're talking about the VBMS system. I'm not sure, but, um, but as far as uh, access to veteran records, I mean, I would think so. It depends on who has access to the computer systems and how VA uh, operates with respect to its rules rules of behavior agreements and some other things that allow uh, attorneys to get temporary access or, or uh, access to their client files uh, electronically. Uh, presently, attorneys can get access to the records through a FOIA, but that process, oh, through the new DOD VA system. Uh, I I wouldn't know that, uh, Roger, uh, that's, um, that's going to deal with, you know, medical records. I would assume that we won't see a significant difference one way or the other, as far as accessing those records, you still have to file for the, that only really affects the VHA. So that's going to be a, um, 
uh, ROI, so a request of information uh, that you put in with VHA, and then they give you the, the, the records on a disc. It'll probably affect how the records look, and hopefully the records will be easier to read than they presently are because right now they're a mess. Uh, so with any stroke of luck, it'll be better. But uh, I don't think it'll affect the timeliness of getting those records. I think that'll be about the same. And do you think, you know, getting back to what we were talking about with the uh, with the VA, do you think we're going to see a lot of people getting bonuses this year? I mean, do you think do you think that uh, David Shulkin is going to sort of hold back on that just to make a, I don't know, a, a good show of it at least that that people are being held accountable? I would not hold your breath. Yeah, <laughs> I was afraid I mean, you were going to say that. You know. Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath. Congress tried to do that once. I know that we had promises from uh, the previous secretaries about not doing it, and then magically they called the bonuses a different thing, uh, and <laughs> suddenly they show up again. You know, so wow. uh, I, last year there was over. You know, I don't remember if it was like hundreds of millions, or uh, it definitely was over a hundred million anyway in bonuses that went out to these folks, and yet. Uh, uh, veterans are still uh, misled about the nature of, of how the VA's budget works, you know, and, and you'll still see some of this um, uh, veteran, veterans sometimes hate on each other if some veterans get benefits that other veterans don't and the other veteran believes that they deserve it more or whatever. You'll see this kind of back and forth sometimes, uh, this kind of class warfare inside the veteran community about uh, who gets what benefits. And, and what you end up seeing is, you know, well, I didn't want the benefits because I wanted them to go to somebody else who's more deserving or uh, something along those lines indicating that VA has like some kind of magic limited budget about certain things. And at the end of the day, you know, you're like entitled, whether you're entitled, you know, whatever, you're either entitled or you're not. But VA gives over $100 million of bonuses to people who should never get bonuses. Uh, yeah. Federal employees didn't used to get bonuses for decades, and the federal government used to work right. Then suddenly we decided to treat federal employees the same way that you would treat a corporate employee. And in fact, that, now they get better health care. They get better bo you know, bonus structures, or at least they get bonuses. Uh, and there are all these other metrics that, you know, at play within the federal government to where that's the best job you can get in, in many fields. So as an example, I'll highlight vocational counselors just because, you know, I went to the um, uh, on Monday, I went to the vocational rehabilitation and employment uh, conference that was held in St. Paul as a guest on a veteran panel to talk about, you know, what veterans experience. And uh, looked around the room, there are, you know, numerous what are called VRE officers. So these are the heads of the offices. But uh, these counselors, they're counselors, they're trained in vocational counseling, which is a master's degree only. Uh, they're getting paid well over 100, many of them are getting paid well over $100,000. And quite a few of those are well over $120,000. And this is one was like, uh, that shocked me, it was a GS-12. I was like, well, how on earth do you get, you know, it was over, I think it was 110000 like, how do you get there with the GS-12? Like, that seemed very strange to me, even at that location. But um, but nonetheless, you know, I look at you look at the pay and and, and these guys have great benefits. <laughs> they they get paid probably more that you get paid in the private sector to do the same type of service. Oh, yeah. And um, and that's what they do. And then some of them are dicks to counsel to veterans and they turn to the veteran and act as though somehow the veteran should be super pleased with finally getting the benefits that they're entitled to, that they serve their country for, you know, and they, they treat us as though we're, we're pariah out there, you know, beggars with their hands out, you know, it's like, no, these are our benefits, but you guys, the folks that are supposed to administer those benefits uh, are getting paid like top dollar for what you do. And, I just, I can't fathom that. I, I just don't understand. So going back to my point about your question about bonuses and the pay structure, I mean, these folks are getting paid so well in many areas, definitely a lot better than, than uh, they should be in my opinion. Um, so I don't see anyone curbing that. I think it's just going to be the way it goes until it collapses. Yeah. David is saying that I don't believe they should get bonuses for doing their jobs. You know, if, in the corporate world, uh, typically when you get a bonus, it's because you deserve it for some type of merit, you know, that you've, mm -hmm. that you've done an extraordinary job or that, that people like what you're doing. Uh, but I don't see a company, you know, that is struggling giving their mm -hmm. people bonuses. It, it makes no sense. And we have the VA, which is, is, is really, if you want to look at it, it's a struggling company. You know, people are dying on wait lists. Nothing's been done uh, about it. You know, we're trying to do things now. 
But so how can you, you know, how can they say, okay, well, we're going to give you a bonus for doing such a great job when there have been mm-hmm. no improvements? It makes no sense. Right. Well, and, and the other part of it, too, is that they are uh, protectors of the public good, you know, and providing services to veterans that, you know, are, are a public good. And in that capacity, you know, when you look at the VA, whenever I see somebody get a bonus at the VA, I know one of two things. Either it, it's the result of them being what's called fiscally responsible, meaning they didn't give somebody something that they might have done. Right. And then otherwise, they're they're processing claims quickly. Those are really the two metrics at the end of the day that seem to matter. Um, and so basically, you know, either they process claims very fast, meaning somebody got screwed, or they didn't pay money to somebody who may have otherwise received it from somebody else. And then for those two purposes, at least in vocational counseling, uh, that person might get a bonus. Wow. Well, I, I wanted to, I have a couple of uh, people who are, are sending in questions and rather than <laughs> coming in the room, maybe they're kind of shy about asking the questions, but so let me, okay. uh, sure. let me give you a, uh, it says Susan and Benjamin, could you discuss Dugway proving grounds, Utah and what the VA has acknowledged about service members and civilian exposures while working there? I was there in 1975. I currently have a service connected claim under the review. What can I expect in the decision? And that's uh, Joe from West Virginia. So, I, you know, the VA has a million scandals all across the board and, and the DOD and the VA have a million problems related to exposures of all kinds of different things. So I can't say that I'm an expert on any one particular area or another. Uh, so this would be an example where, where I really don't know. This isn't something I'm familiar with um, offhand, though. I mean, your question is basically, uh, you know, to paraphrase, you have a, a, what I would call a small arbitrary instance of, you know, exposure that isn't necessarily in the press uh, in the same way that Camp Lejeune is. It took Camp Lejeune and Agent Orange to, you know, exposure type problems uh, 40 years to really hit the press to get justice. Um, That issue in Utah is not really in the press as far as I'm aware. Assume that you might wait until you die to get those benefits because uh, until something hits the press, usually goes on the back burner and VA fights tooth and nail when it comes to exposures. Uh, that's an area where they don't like to pay out no matter what. And uh, they're still fighting Agent Orange exposure. They're still fighting Camp Lejeune and, and fighting the nuances of the definitions to try to screw veterans out of money. Again, the Department of Veterans Affairs used to be called the Bureau of War Risk Insurance. I'll say that again, the Bureau of War Risk Insurance. It is not any different today other than the name and the folks that are in charge. You know, So the heads and the names and the faces or whatever on the Titanic are new, but it's still the same insurance company. It's just got a different name. They still have the same policies. The policies are still excessively restrictive, and they're that way to basically... They act as an Department of Defense. Uh, coincidentally, they both have, uh, a, basically, it's like the DOD has two chairs uh, in the cabinet instead of just one, like used to be the case before 1988 when the VA became a uh, cabinet level agency. So they work hand in glove together. They, you know, that entity, which I think is really just the DOD, um, at the end of the day is, you know, just serving as an uh, insurance company for the DOD and covering their butts. And so uh, when you deal with an insurance company, don't expect the insurance company to treat you fairly at all. Right. They're looking out for their shareholder. And in this instance, the shareholder is the Department of Defense because the money that gets allocated away from them that goes to the VA is less uh, you know, tanks that they can get from a contract from their buddy. Um, it's less spooks that we can put in the field through the State Department. So when you look at how the budget is allocated, those are things to keep in mind. So You know, the VA is just basically a parasite on the back of the DOD, according to a lot of the people in the DOD. You know, they want that money for other things, you know, a new jet that might not work or, uh, you know, some other tank that we don't need. So, you know, these are things that are priorities for some folks in the DOD. And that's really where they want the money to go, not to Joe Blow in the community who will spend that money in the community and prop up their local gas stations, grocery stores, local commerce. You know, they don't want the money there. They want it to go into the offshore banks where a lot of these companies have their holdings. That's where they want the money to go. Wow. Now, Roger's saying, how soon can we expect someone to exercise the new accountability? Well, I guess it's whenever the (laughs) 
law becomes law and then it uh, is going to be um, passed through notice and comment, uh, I assume. So that process can take up to a year or longer for notice and comment to happen. But that doesn't stop the, uh, you know, Office of Accountability from doing something. But I don't anticipate that we're going to see the type of resolve that we might have hoped uh, or that we were sold. I think that what we're going to see is a clamping down on whistleblowers. Um, and I mean, they could have fired a lot of these jokers before they could have been going to jail before they didn't. Uh, I don't think that this new law was necessary. They just needed to enforce common sense, uh, you know, ethics and they yeah. just didn't do it. They didn't care. <laughs> Now I have another question uh, from Jethro. Uh, I said, Benjamin, I contacted VRNE at uh, Texas. I was told that I will not, uh, that I was told they will not cover my travel nor stay to undergo an independent living program because I live overseas in South America. I am a hundred percent P and T PTSD. Your input is appreciated. So the question is basically uh, VA won't do X, Y, and Z because I live overseas. Uh, I get that a lot. Uh, VA does say that they can't provide certain services to people overseas. Um, again, this happens in a lot of different benefits adjudications, and I'm not an expert in every every particular issue. But I can imagine that if VA is saying that uh, because you live overseas, that getting that to change, I mean, you're going to have to look at the regulations that are cited um, or policies that are cited to see if they line up with your facts. And if they do, and it precludes your use of that benefit, then, you know, you're out of luck. But if they're wrong, then, you know, you, maybe you have a right to an appeal. But um, if they're saying basically in order to do X, Y, and Z, you're going to have to pay out of pocket right now, then you're going to have to pay out of pocket right now, buddy. I mean, that's just the end of the end of the road for you. Um, pay out of pocket, get it done, and then try to get reimbursed later and file an appeal. But if you need the services now, um, then you got to do it. You know, then it's just the way it is. And you can try to get, you know, the money back later. But um, don't expect in instances where VA doesn't want to help you, don't expect that there's going to be a quick fix to that. You know, it's going to take years to sort out through an appeal and probably hiring an attorney to uh, evaluate the case. So um, that's, but in that type of situation, though, let's keep in mind, Lots of Americans hire attorneys for lots of things. Attorneys are hired to do hard things and to prosecute claims in normal courts. Uh, as veterans, we shouldn't expect anything less. I don't know why sometimes veterans expect, you know, um, VA to jump over, you know, through circus hoops um, for them without hiring uh, an attorney. That doesn't happen in reality outside of the VA. You know, you better hire an attorney if you got a problem like that. So why would you expect? anything less in the VA. I mean, they care even less for us in the capacity that each veteran is, is sucking revenue out of the system that the DOD wants. DOD wants that. Why would they treat you any differently? If you, if you conflict with, or your facts conflict, conflict with the clear policy or the clear regulation, um, don't expect that's going to change, you know, and you may have to pay out the money or hire an attorney to get it done. You know, that's just the reality. That's the way it got you. Yeah. When Jerry's asking a question, if you fail to send in a form, uh, in form nine after receiving an SOC, but you did send more information to them. Does this create an intent to keep the claim active? And do you stand a chance of keeping your claim active? Um, each case is very different. And when a veteran supplies what is called new and material evidence, the uh, in response to the SOC, that's essentially an SOC rebuttal. Uh, the government is required to, send a supplemental statement of the case. However, you know, by the time you go before the board, you know, there's really no telling how that's going to be interpreted. Uh, the good practice is to always send in the form nine uh, before the 60 day window lapses. And outside of that, then your claim is basically screwed. But uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be exceptions and it all depends on, you know, the nuances of each case. But if you, you know, didn't do that, then there may be some other ways to basically peel back the, the finality of that. But, um, but you won't really know until the board gets it and until the board makes an opinion on it. And then you'll know whether you have grounds to attack. But, um, but you know, basically without the Form 9, then they won't certify it to the board. So 
uh, you'll probably have to, if that is accurate, then you'll have to file a writ of mandamus to force the uh, VA to render a decision as to whether the material you provided was new and material uh, for the purpose of requiring a supplemental statement of the case and, and give that a whirl and you may or may not have merit. Each, each situation is different. So, um, so that might be the avenue to force the Department of Veterans Affairs to issue a supplemental statement of the case and then, um, then give you a window to file the Form 9. But, um, but each case is different. Um, let, here's another question for you. So I'm a registered nurse and the SO of a disabled veteran. Current rate is 60% uh, lot SOF retaliation, falsification of documentation, refuse to provide care, verbal assault by a patient advocate. Uh, I'm worried that re-rating will be a retaliation fest uh, once they find out I was in the regulation industry. Denial of patient caregiver program for bogus reasons. What are your options or what are the options? Is that um, So there's a, a lot of uh, different things in that particular question. So I'm not uh, clear about the, the option, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So what... It, can you restate that a different way? Can that question be restated? Um, I'm not sure that it can, <laughs> to be honest with you. No, I know there very, was a lot. It's very fact dense. And so, yes. yeah. um, can, can you re, I'm sorry. Can you reread it again? I'm going to have to try see to see if I can find that. Uh, Cause I, whoops, I'm getting you when I turn that on. Um, oh. Yeah. Let me just see if I can go back to the notifications. Um, it says that I'm a registered nurse and the SO of a disabled veteran. Current rate is 60% lot, uh, SOF retaliation, falsification of documentation. Re okay. So here's my feedback. Too okay. many acronyms. So whoever <laughs> sent that in, I don't know what you're talking about. There are lots okay. of acronyms in there and I don't know what they all mean. So it makes it hard for me to piece together yeah. exactly what the question is. So try to, um, use non-military speak or non-government speak with, uh, you know, acronyms and just kind of spell it out. Otherwise, um, you know, I'm not familiar with every acronym that, that I hear. So that's, that's yeah. like, I don't know what SO means. Um, yeah, well, and it could have been, you know, maybe just, maybe she was trying to print something quickly and it came out a, sure. a different one, but I, I guess she was saying the VA hates the DOD caregiver program. So, you know, her, her oh, question. Oh, caregiver to... program. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, that program, you know, has been attacking veterans who are in the program and making false statements about them to graduate the veteran. They call it, I think, graduation. They graduate the veteran out of the program uh, saying that the veteran has gotten better um, somehow. So uh, that doesn't mean that it's true. That doesn't mean that the veteran did get better. But I know that the caregiver program is trying to graduate veterans out of it so that they aren't as expensive. So um, in that type of a situation file, I guess I would file a clinical appeal or, a, um, I haven't handled one yet personally, but I might here soon, uh, which would be a, either a clinical appeal, depending on what you're appealing or a healthcare appeal or health benefits appeal. So, um, but they use kind of real squishy terminology in that program. So you have to be real careful, uh, what you're doing and what you're going to try to try to appeal. All right. So what was the next question? I think I saw something uh, from Roger again. Well, there's one uh, from Ed. It says, is it true that after 20 years, your benefits cannot be reduced or taken away? So, uh, generally, as I understand it, the benefits can't be, um, reduced or taken away unless they prove some kind of fraud, uh, or misrepresentation. Uh, and then if that's the case, then obviously they can do whatever they want. So, wow. uh, but after 20 years, you should be insulated from uh, like arbitrary, what I would call like arbitrary um, requests to be reevaluated, you know, stuff like that. So you should be okay at that point. You know, a while ago too, we were talking a little bit about Agent Orange and you talked about Camp Lejeune and how that was kind of going through. I, I want to know, there was a, you, it, I think you'd written an article or it came out in uh, ProPublica, I guess it was, about Jim Sampsel, who is a, a lead analyst within the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. And he was talking oh, yeah, right. about Agent Orange. Can you tell us a little bit about what he was talking about? Yeah. So here, I'm going to pull it up real quick just okay. to make sure that I uh, am speaking from. Get all the I facts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I write so frequently that sometimes uh, the, the, the sequences are, 
um, uh, muddied. So basically, he's saying that, um, you know, I, I'll just say that uh, I bet that this Samsel character is probably a jerk face. Uh, I'll say that out loud. I think he's a jerk face. Uh, and if he has a problem with that, he can talk to me. But, uh, you know, from reading this, he gets into some arguments that aren't uh, legal. And uh, it makes some assertions that Agent Orange isn't as bad as as uh, we say it is. Therefore, the despite you know, despite the medical science uh, community, you know, screw them. Uh, us in VA, we know better, and we know that it wasn't as bad. And you veterans are lying. You know, you veterans are lying, whiner babies, and suck it up. I'm a Vietnam veteran too, because he was, and uh, and I'm fine. So look at me, you know. And so he made a bunch of assertions, uh, and I'll walk through a couple of these very quickly here on the website. Um, they're saying basically uh, he believes Agent Orange contained, quote, very, very small amounts of dioxin, which was quickly destroyed by sunlight in the open air. That's not commonly acknowledged by advocates, he complains as a whiner face, jerk face. Uh, moreover, Samson said, U.S. planes did not spray it when American troops were in the area. Duh. Um, so yeah, thanks, Samsel. Um, thanks for, you know, uh, basically exposing your level of ignorance and, and idiocy, uh, to the American public. Uh, glad that you were outed by ProPublica. They do uh, good work there most of the time and appreciate that they exposed you as being the, the con that you are. So what was uh, his expertise on that? You know, why does he think he knows exactly I, what I have said? tried to find his background and I <laughs> cannot. So He's an uh, as far as I can tell, he is a not doctor. So yeah. <laughs> whatever he is, not doctor. Um, uh, and I'm not sure beyond that, that we really need to worry about it. The concern though, is that he's in a position of authority, making yeah. decisions internally that are resulting in veterans being wrongly denied. Then he besmirched the repu reputation of the Board of Veterans Appeals for granting some of these claims as exposure to herbicide. Now, here's the big con with all of this, like all of this with Agent Orange. The big con is that they're basing it off of some research that was done by Alvin Young, who, as I understand it, was never published in a peer-reviewed journal. He does have a PhD. He did work in the Air Force. He was then hired by Dow and Monsanto to be a hired gun and to support their conclusions. Now, I don't know how many, I don't even know if Samsel did this, but I personally went to DC and I went to Maryland and I went through the Alvin Young collection on Asian Orange that's housed at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Library. Personally, I only made it through A to C. So, so that was, that's it. I didn't make it through any of the other stuff and that spent an entire day doing this. Uh, but wow. basically, here's the con. And in this, I only learned this in reading through a, a Dow chemical, um, article that they published in their own journal um, that is, uh, I wouldn't say named in an obvious manner. So if you're looking at it, you wouldn't know that Dow put this out. But when you read what they wrote, they uh, come to these conclusions about Agent Orange exposure or dioxin exposure based off of what the normal person would be exposed to in working with those chemicals in the factory. But guess what? The U.S. government wasn't using it that way. We weren't. Right. We were using it as you would call an FDA land, off-label use. We use it as a chemical weapon, according to Russia. Russia said in their own one of their own journals, uh, journals that they um, that the U.S. was using it as a chemical weapon to make people sick, and we were spraying people with uh, concentrations a hundred times what you're supposed to use, making people very ill, and and destroying crops in the earth for decades, making children ill you know, decades of people ill, uh, multiple generations of Vietnamese sick without legs, without eyes. I've seen the pictures. They're grotesque uh, as far as, you know, the fact that we did this and we sprayed these babies uh, and these, and these uh, fetuses, these mothers that were pregnant, et cetera, with this stuff. And it caused these problems. But anyway, the point going back to Samsel is that he uh, looks at this kind of from the, the narrow view, I'm a government employee stooge uh, perspective, which is, um, you know, what the government says is true, except when it disagrees with our particular line, which, you know, we have the uh, uh, NIH, I think it's gone on record that says that it's worse than what the VA is asserting. Uh, but 
but uh, you know, VA apparently knows better in their narrow view. And they're like, well, uh, we only believe the folks over here on the left hand, not the right hand. We're not going to explain exactly why, but you know, that's just, but they agree with that. So therefore we're going to agree with them. (laughs) Right. And we're going to deny claims that are outside of this tiny little window. But again, for him to say this outrageous claim that very, very small amounts of dioxin were used, that is absolutely absurd. Absolutely absurd. We were spraying our troops. We were putting it into the water. People were drinking it because they didn't have water to drink. They got sick. There's no question. But, you know, the VA was only willing to allow, I think it was called chloria or something like that, which is basically acne. That was the only disability that they acknowledged at first from Agent Orange exposure. Of course, you know, fortunately, the scientific community had since looked at this and realized dioxin is highly toxic and it causes all these problems. Uh, Coincidentally, many of these problems are very similar to what we're seeing in Gulf War. Uh, and some of the dioxins that are put into the gases there from burning radioactive and toxic stuff in burn pits and then put into the air. So a very similar um, um, result here. And I, I can guarantee that we'll see a similar type of fight with the Department of Veterans Affairs for the next 40 years for all the Gulf War veterans that are sick. Uh, but anyway, his whole point basically is, you know, we don't believe the Institute of Medicine or the National Academy of Medicine Uh, We don't trust what they say. Uh, We decide that we're going to go off of Young's research. And Young concluded that, you know, these results are, shouldn't have, you know, aren't real. So VA, we're going to go with that one, you know. And and again, Young was not published in a peer-reviewed journal. He did research this, but he eventually stabbed folks in the back and then became the hired gun of Dow. I mean, I don't think you need to know much else. But that's the angle no, that they're looking at in the VA. Yeah, but the board, on the other hand, that looks at this legally, uh, looks at these arguments and, and the law and realize, well, well, if a veteran says they were in combat and they were sprayed with Agent Orange, et cetera, et cetera, there are presumptives you know, that are in place because we know it was pretty bad. Uh, but what uh, this joker, um, Samsel, is trying to do is he's trying to rein in these claims, trying to make it so that the VA doesn't have more presumptives, including hypertension and high blood pressure. Um, And then they're trying to attribute those symptoms uh, or conditions and diagnoses to other things. um, As they always do. As they always do. This is the same game. I mean, it happens frequently. We're seeing it again. And this Samsung guy, you know, uh, Rick Weidman thinks he should be fired. I agree. (laughs) Uh, he's making conclusions that, uh, wouldn't be made or shouldn't be made by an attorney, which is part of why they disagree so strongly with how the board of veterans appeals, you know, attorneys have been responding to this stuff, uh, because they're attorneys, but Samson knows better. Right. But we just don't know what his training is or his expertise, but he knows better. And, uh, they're going to deny claims and push them up to the board and veterans will wait another five years, uh, for VA to not get it right, maybe. Or maybe they do get it right. Who knows? But another five year delay. So when the when the offspring of the veterans, you know, how were they impacted? Is that was that um you know could, because I've heard that too, that that children of, of uh veterans with um Agent Orange uh-huh. were impacted. Was that because of the fetus? I mean, tell me that how that happened. So generally speaking, um spina bifida is one of the recognized conditions from Asian orange exposure. If your parent was exposed to Asian orange, um, the biological parent, then we know that it is likely that that person, or at least there's a pres- presumptive that spina bifida uh, resulted if it's a certain type. Uh, I think there's spina bifida occulta and then there's another type. Uh, one is uh, considered connected and the other one isn't. Um, but VA does provide a small degree of care for these kids and has been since 96. That bill and legislation was pushed through, and and uh, but it was unfunded. And so the VA has fought against veterans' children with spina bifida um, getting the benefits for years. And my good friend Ron Nessler, the founder of uh, VA is Lying, uh, actually fought for his daughter, his uh, adoptive daughter's benefits, whose biological father was a four, four, three or four tour uh, Marine. Uh, and he um, fought for his his daughter, Honey Sue, um, his adopted daughter, and they ended up uh, finally winning after about a decade of fighting for the benefits very hard. And and legislation was passed on their behalf that VA ignored. 
flat ignored it because they had these internal policies that were more restrictive than the regulations that came out of those those uh, like laws like they were literally talked about and discussed at these legislative hearings in congress laws were passed and va still screwed them like you can't go any further than that we eventually uh, embarrassed the yeah. agency um in 2012 2013 and uh finally after ron threatened that he would commit suicide and cut his own throat um on the footsteps of a unnamed va facility uh they finally granted honey sue the benefits so that's what it took uh, in that instance. And then they called the police on Ron. And while Ron was uh, napping in his underwear, the police <laughs> showed up on his doorstep and tried to force their way into the uh, house that he lives in. Uh, he called me at that moment in uh, great fear for his life, not knowing why these armed police were trying to break into his house. Wow. And, uh, uh, you know, it became another mess. And then VA retaliated against him and, and uh, pulled away his fee basis, uh, non VA care card at the time. Uh, and we had to fight that and, uh, we got that reinstated. Uh, you know, Ron's very public about this and, and, uh, that's why I'm confident that, that I've, uh, well, he's given me permission to speak about it as an attorney, but, Mm -hmm. um, that's how VA is lying came to be, by the way, that's the genesis Mm -hmm. of VA is lying. He called me up one day and was like, Hey, Ben, I got this idea. Facebook group called (laughs) VA is lying. What do you think? And I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Like that's, that's like one of the best marketing slogans I've ever heard. Uh, and then a, f- a short time after that, we discussed uh, crowdsourcing billboards and Ron took the initiative and did that. And next thing you know, a bunch of billboards went up all across the country. Thanks to that discussion and Ron's initiative uh, saying VA is lying. Veterans are dying. <laughs> I know. Like, a lot of people in that group. Better. I know. Oh man, and and those guys like the VA was so embarrassed, and <laughs> they they would cry about it uh, on a regular basis. And it got to the point where here in Minneapolis, for example, we put up uh, three signs here that triangulated the VA in all corners, and the VA employees, including union employees, cried about it, and they were very upset that veterans would you know engage in this type of First Amendment speech. And uh, the director of the facility, Pat Kelly, had to remind his employees that veterans have rights including the First Amendment right that they fought to protect for you, <laughs> they can have it too. And uh, and this is the result of that. You know, VA is lying, veterans are dying. You know, join the Unbelievable. Facebook. Unbelievable. Yeah, so um, that's, that's kind of the story there. We have a couple more questions, so let me get them in. From James, he said, I heard that some veterans, when they put in for an increase for disability, the VA is turning it around and rewarding them a de- decrease. How can they do that if the records show that the conditions have worsened? Oh, well, good question. Um, How can they do that? God, let me think about this. Is the VA an insurance company? Yes. Oh, my God. Ding, 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 ding. VA is an insurance company. Uh, Will they have an incentive to screw up and and, uh, screw the veteran out of benefits, even if it's just for a minute? Absolutely. So why should we be surprised when this happens? Uh, We shouldn't. Because it's an insurance company. They don't care about you, man. They're trying to keep money for the DOD, man, so they can get more bombs, they can get more trucks, you know, whatever they do. Or bonuses. Bonuses, man. Bonuses. I mean, geez, fiscal, you know, responsibility, meaning, you know, screwing bets. So uh, don't be surprised if that happens. Um, They're not supposed to do it. If your facts are in line with the policy that you're supposed to, or regulation that says you should have an increase, you should. But don't think for one second that VA won't try to screw you. If VA does that, they try to reverse your claim and and lower it, then you have to appeal. This is just part of the process. But I can guarantee you there are bean counters somewhere that are directing these types of decisions so that they can result at their fiscal goals and get their fiscal bonus. And that's what's really going on. It's all about the bonuses. It's all about the behind the scenes. I think, you know, I liken this to the, uh, you know, the reality that VA doesn't have an unfettered budget because, you know, the DOD needs more bombs. They need to create more ISIS. They need to, you know, keep that drum going so we get more, you know, chicken hawks telling us to go to war so our kids get sick or die or whatever happens. You know, that's what, you know, the the machine wants. So uh, don't be surprised if they try to take it out of your hide and they will, you know, they, they will take it out of your hide and they'll use that money to create slush funds that don't exist, you know, which they've done uh, and we're caught doing, you know? Um, So don't think that that uh, doesn't happen. It does. And don't think that you're uh, above that. You know, any of us could be hit with that type of a scheme uh, and attacked in that way. And, And they don't care about the economic, a trauma or actual trauma that that such a, a witch hunt uh, results in. You know they don't care about you 
I know that Veterans Affairs sounds benevolent and nice, but it's not. It's the Bureau of War Risk Insurance. Let's call a spade a spade. They're looking out for the DOD and their cronies who are government contractors. At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. You do have some people that are in there that are doing good stuff, that really care about veterans and are really pushing the machine. I understand that. They're at all levels within the VA. But at the end of the day, the VA is designed to not work. It's not supposed to work. It's not supposed to work for the veteran. It's never worked for the veteran. So how do I know that it's not designed to do that? Because it never does that. It's never done that. It's never truly worked for the veteran. It never will. Uh, the policies that are in place have been in place since FDR. FDR created those policies through the genesis from the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, which then became the Veterans Administration. He redid those policies and tweaked them so they were even more restrictive so he could use the money for the New Deal. So he wanted to move the money that was going to veterans into the New Deal so he could pay for other stuff. And those policies are still what we have today in large part, whether it's some variation or not. Some of them are verbatim the same. And that's what we have. It's an insurance company, plain and simple. We need to realize that they want to keep the money. They don't want it to go to you. You know, it's just not designed to do that. It's never done that in an effective and efficient and fair manner. It's not going to do it. Nothing's going to change. It's going to be the same agency. And, and you know, the, the again, the faces might change, the deck chairs change, but it's still at the end of the day going to be screwing vets in a different way. <sighs> Boy, that doesn't sound too encouraging, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of like no matter how many acts are passed, we're still going to get the same results or maybe just a, a slight improvement. It kind of sounds like, let, let mm -hmm. me get to another question. Ed said, if my injury uh, or condition has gotten worse or deteriorated since my initial medical evaluation board rating of 40% 20 years ago, would I file a new claim or is it a continuing claim? And how long can I expect to get uh, before getting a decision? Should I use a VSO or a law firm that specializes in VA affairs or just gather the evidence and file on my own? Well, um, so each case is different. I'm not going to be able to give you fact specific uh, advice here because right. you asked a lot of very nuanced issues and I can't tell unless I really look at the record. Um, what I would say for new claims, generally you're going to have to go get them filed by the a VSO or yourself, most attorneys, including myself. Uh, I don't work in the arena of original claims. I only get involved after the agency is uh, screwed up. Uh, veterans are precluded by law from hiring an attorney to help them. So, uh, you know, really the VA doesn't want attorneys in the initial uh, sequence. They want to be able to build evidence against you without legal representation. And that's just the way it is until we change it. So, um, I don't work in that part of the claims process. I only work in the appeals, uh, end of things after the VA makes a mistake that I can address, uh, um, or resolve. So in other words, if, it, if the claim has merit. So in this instance, it sounds like you have some element of a new claim. Maybe if it's a new claim, go through that process, uh, fill out the easy form, um, and then, uh, develop your case yourself. Now, a VSO generally will not help you build your case out. They will instead usually just put a very short explanation on the form that they file for you. And then if you get denied, then they'll try to provide legal representation to you. I would never want a VSO to provide legal representation to me, to my family members, to my friends, and to people I hate. Uh, that's, you know, that's the issue. What was Roger's question there? I saw something. Pop Roger off. says not quite true. They can hire a lawyer. They just can't pay him or her until, until they appeal. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, the term hire uh, implies payment. So when you hire somebody, that's usually what that means. Yeah, you can you can have an attorney do stuff. That is true. But, um, but you can't hire an attorney. Uh, I, I just think that, at least from my perspective, the term hire implies payment of some kind, some kind of compensation or consideration for services. And, and that cannot be done. So yes, you can, uh, an attorney can provide free pro bono, pro bono representation, but I don't consider that hiring. Uh, so I've gotten into this with a couple of people before. I think it's a subtle uh, difference, but um, may, maybe I'm you know misusing the term, but I believe that hire usually implies payment of some kind or some kind of consideration for services rendered. And uh, attorneys are precluded by law from doing that until 
after the veteran is denied and after the veteran files a notice of disagreement. Um, so, yeah, Ed was saying t- that he had his back broken and it is getting worse. And so that's why he is looking to either oh. file another claim. So that you would file a claim probably to reopen uh, based on new material evidence, which would include in that instance that your back is worse. Um, I would be careful to make sure that you know exactly what your evidence says before you present it, because it is very possible, as we're seeing, that VA is going to start drawing down on these claims to reopen by being heavily restrictive on the uh, manner in which the evidence comes to them. So uh, just be careful and make sure the evidence says what you think it says and make sure that lines up with the regulation before you file. Uh, and, and, um, and so that's, you know, that's what I would say. Now, I, as I understand it, and I, I don't have the regulation in front of me, in an instance when you reopen an earlier claim with new material evidence, it's possible that I think you can hire a lawyer for pay after you file. Um, but I don't, I have to look at the uh, regulation again. I usually don't handle those types of claims either. It's just usually a flat denial within the uh, 12 month period uh, for an appeal. Now we have uh, probably just time for real quick here for last question. Why is VRE saying that I am okay for VRE now after they messed up now five times? They are saying that if you found to need I L I don't know what that is. Then you get uh, then you get things, but they have already done this four times. Also went for TBI. Now they said because my TBI was before two thousand one, they will not treat it. Sounds like a really complicated issue there. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of complicated facts. So um, I am aware that some VA facilities are refusing care to veterans who uh, are seeking TBI care uh, for a TBI that occurred before two thousand one, or if the veteran you know was left out. So, um, so like if you exited the military in 1999, you had a TBI in 1998, uh, that veteran in some instances is going to be unable to get health care for traumatic brain injury residuals at their VA because according to VA, they can only help people, uh, who are post 9-11. That's, you know, again, this is an area of restrictive policies that are internal to VA. They're supposed to provide you with health care. But they they ration that health care, uh, you know, and again, the VA does engage in death panels. Um, they call it something different, but it has the effect of being a death panel. They do uh, ration and restrict access to health care based off of various criteria, even if you need it. And they'll just they just won't give it to you. They'll have you go on a rat race or do different tests and they'll have you do tests all the time without providing any kind of care that is uh, beneficial and rehabilitated for those folks. So um, I have seen this in some VA facilities. You know, and I also wanted to just tell Thomas that I'm, I'm hoping to have somebody that is experienced in HBOT come on the show in the coming weeks so that you can talk mm-hmm. more about how uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is being used for TBI. And according to what I've heard and the what the uh, doctors are saying, they've had a lot of uh, – positive results more so than how the VA typically treats it with pills and things of that nature. So I hope Thomas that you uh, keep watching and that you do come back and, and listen to that show, because I think that the word needs to get out that there is more help. And, and this particular organization, it's a nonprofit organization uh, that if you're qualified, you know, if you have TBI, then they, uh, you know, they pay for your treatment. So it's not like it's out of pocket. That's my understanding of it. And again, when we have the, you know, the real expert on, they're going to be able to tell you everything, what you need to know and, and how you would be able to get um, care for H, uh, HBOT with them. And I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And, and I know that uh, Texas is starting, has signed in a law recently saying that the VA has to start offering HBOT for, for patients. Now, Again, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. We probably need to do more research on that. But I think that's a that's a really nice start uh, right. for them to, in the right direction. So and I think other states need to do that, and especially if you can uh, heal somebody with TBI in a short amount of time rather than a lifetime of having to deal with that by medication and, and, and things that right. aren't seemingly just not working. You know, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
So I want to thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you for, very much for your comments and uh, coming on and asking uh, Ben the questions that you wanted to ask. Hope everything got answered. Uh, please do share this, if you will. It will be up on the page. Share this with other veterans so that they may get some uh, benefit out of it. Uh, and uh, I know Kate has one quick last question, but we'll have to uh, you know, try to get that at another time. We thank Ben for coming on as a guest today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, guys, for coming in and all the comments. Uh, and uh, we do appreciate it. Ben, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, uh, we'll see. Me. Yeah, thank you. And, and we'll have another show for you again next week. Thank you again. And God bless everybody. We'll take care. Take care. Bye-bye.